Thanksgiving is a wonderful time. We give thanks to God for the freedoms that we still have in this country, for our family, for the many blessings. Amen. Amen. And uh, we're going to actually have a service on Tuesday night, just a one-hour service, 7.30, 8.30, short service, and we're going to give thanks, and we invite you out. We'd really love to have you come if you'd like to come. So. But we're in a series from the book of Nehemiah. Just take a sip. And I hope that you're reading with us through the Bible. One of the sad things of the American church is that a lot of people are becoming biblically illiterate. They don't read the Bible, they don't listen to the Bible anymore, and that's a dangerous thing, very dangerous. So that's one of the reasons why we're asking you to read uh, 10 chapters a week, and I've been trying to preach along. Sometimes I get a little ahead of myself, sometimes I get a little behind. But we're finishing up Nehemiah, and I may stay in the book for another week or two. But last week... I talked to you about looking differently at problems. Looking different at problems. Because a lot of people say, oh, they just give me a headache. It's just such a headache, all the problems. And I said, you know what? You should look at problems from a divine perspective because sometimes the things that come into your life as problems are God-ordained for you to fix. You can be a walking solution to someone's problem and you bring glory to God when you do that. So we talked about that last week, looking at Nehemiah. Nehemiah saw a huge problem in Jerusalem, and he left his country, his family, he left his position, and he went back to rebuild the wall and hang the gates and change the whole atmosphere of these depressed people because the work of God had come to a stop in Israel. And he said, you know what, I'm going to solve a problem. I'm going to go back there and give my time, my money, my energy, my talents, my testimony, my prayers, my fasting. I'm going to give everything I can to help the work of God. And so remember that. Well, today we're going to look at something. We're not going to look at problems differently, but we're going to look at opposition differently. Opposition. When things come into your life and oppose you, uh, maybe you think, you know what, I just can't stand those people that oppose me. Well, Sometimes they're God-ordained, sometimes they're not. And you need to look at it. Because sometimes we forget that all the principles that Jesus Christ taught seem upside down to the principles that the world teaches us. You know, the world tells us, climb up the ladder of success, kick people off the ladder as you go up, you get someone off the ladder, you get up there quicker. But Jesus says, no, no, no. Humble yourself in the sight of God, and he will what? He'll lift you up. It it, it seems different. Jesus said, some first shall be last, and some last shall be. That don't make sense. The New Testament says, you draw near to God, and then God will draw near to. Oh, no. If the big guy in the sky wants me, he's got my address. How many of you have heard that one before? No. You draw near unto God. He draws near to you. All right? Let me give you one more. Jesus said, with your finances, give it away. Give to the church. Give to the poor. Give to the people. Give to your brother, sister. Give, and it shall be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. For with the same measure you give, it shall be given back to you. That doesn't make sense, does it? The kingdom principles seem awfully different from the kingdom or the worldly principles we learn. And so you have to look at these things, how the world looks at problems and how Jesus talks about problems. And today we're going to talk about opposition. Nehemiah says, you know what, I'm going to go back, I'm going to help these people with the work of God, and we're going to go back and we're going to rise and we're going to build the wall. And any time the people of God say, let us arise and let us do a great work for God, Satan says, let us arise and let us oppose the great work that they're trying to do for God. You with me? He always opposes what the people of God wants to do. And he always has people that will help him oppose. And so we're going to look at this because I want you to know opposition in your life doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. 
It could mean that you're doing something absolutely right. People say, I got no problems. I got no problems. I got no opposition. Well, how many know when the devil's walking arm in arm with you, you're not going to have any opposition? Paul said to Timothy, and let me just quote it, 2 Timothy 3.12. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You want to do a work for God? You want to live godly? You're going to have persecution. It just happens. Opposition is going to come into your life. The important thing is that we make sure it comes in our life because we're doing something for his name, not for our name. Paul said to the Galatians, the Galatians were having a lot of issues in their church, and they were doing a hard work for God, and Paul said, listen, do not be weary in doing good, for in due season you're going to reap if you faint not. Sometimes when you do a work from God, it gets tiring, it gets exhausting, but God says, don't give up. Amen? Don't give up. So let's turn to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 4. And uh, girls, I'm going to ask you to just turn me down a little bit. I got a little bit of an echo in my mic. Nehemiah chapter 4, maybe turn me down in the gain. And we're going to read the first 15 verses. And we're going to look at opposition differently. Opposition a little differently, okay? Turn me up just a little bit more on the monitors. So it happened when Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, doing a work of God, doing something for the kingdom of God, that he was what? Say it out loud. You think you're going to do something for God and the, and the people of the kingdom of the darkness is going to be happy? He was furious and very indignant and he mocked the Jews. All right, He mocked them. He opposed them, he ridiculed them. And he spoke before the brethren in the army of Samaria, not the army of Israel, the army of Samaria. And he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him. And he said, Whatever they build, even if a little fox goes up on it, he will break it down, their stone wall. And so Nehemiah prayed this prayer. Hear, O God, for we are despised for doing your work. We're despised for doing what's right. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. He says, we, we are in captivity for seven years. We're just coming back. We're trying to do a work of God. And they're mocking us. And they're just opposing us. They're belittling us. Now, Lord, you do to them what they're trying to do to us because we're only doing something for you. Well, that's a bold prayer. Do not cover their iniquity. Ooh, boy. Do not let their sin be blotted out from before you for they have provoked you to anger before the what? Now, you've got to understand this. We'll talk about this prayer next week. But he said, I don't have an axe to grind with these people. They're trying to stop, not me, Lord. They're trying to stop your work, <laughs> your wall, your gates. If this doesn't go up, I don't know if you know, but Nehemiah is one of the last voices in the Old Testament 400 years before Jesus Christ comes. And if Nehemiah doesn't get this work done, it's going to be hard for the Messiah to come in and the people to come back. He's got to get this done. So verse 6, So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Hallelujah, they are united. Now it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the Ashdodites heard the wall of Jerusalem was being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed that they became very angry, angry at the work of God. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and to create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God. Now, it doesn't tell us what this prayer was. God didn't have it written down. But they made another prayer to God. And because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. Then Judah said, 
The strength of the laborers is failing. And there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. I hear that around here sometimes. Pastor, we need more help in the nursery. We need more help in Sunday school. We need more help in the food pantry. We need more help. The the strength is, is waning. It happens in the work of God, doesn't it? It happens. All right. Don't be weary in well-doing. Verse 10. Then Judah said, The strength of the laborers is failing, and there is so much rubbish we are not able to build the wall. And our adversary said, They will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst, and we kill them. And cause what? The work of God to cease. That's the whole. We want to we stop the work of God. All right. So it was when the Jews who dwelt there came and they told us, how many times did they gossip? How many times did they pass this slander? Ten times. Does the devil ever get tired of slander and gossip? Ten times. Ten times. For whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. Therefore I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall and at the openings, and I set the people according to the families with swords and spears and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and the leaders and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid. Amen? Another tactic of the devil, fear. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord, great and awesome. He will fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us that our God had brought a plot to nothing. He brought the scheming, the slander, the gossip, the lies, the fear. Our God brought it to nothing. That all of us return to the wall, everyone to his own work. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we talk about looking at opposition differently, I pray, Lord, that you would encourage some of us, Lord. We're opposed because of what we do for your church. We're opposed because we are not ashamed to call ourselves a Christian. We're followers of you. Some of us, Lord, oppose us at work. Some of us oppose us at home. Some of us oppose us in our neighborhood. But, Lord, I pray, Father, that you would encourage us. Help us to, Lord God, take heart that opposition is a part of doing something for you. And I pray, Lord, that you would, Father, encourage us all today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the enemies of God, Sanballat, Tobiah, Ashdodites, Ammonites, and even some of their own Jews began to oppose the work of God and ridicule them, mock them. Make up stories and lie about them and pass it all around. It was terrible. But I want you to know that one of the chief weapons of Satan in his arsenal, how do you know that we have weapons in Jesus Christ? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We have the weapon of the word of God. We have the weapon of the name of Jesus. We have the weapon of the blood of Jesus. Amen. Don't we have several weapons that we can use? How do you know Satan has weapons? And he uses those against us. He uses them against the church. He uses them all the time. And one of the great weapons of Satan was what I was talking to the children about, is when he ridicules us. Some of us would rather get punched in the gut than to have someone ridicule us. We can at least take the pain right away. But ridicule just keeps going on and on and on. And it says that ten times. They ridiculed them. They lied and they slandered. And sticks and stones may break our bones, but names will never hurt. They do hurt, don't they? They they do hurt. It's not easy being ridiculed as a Christian, but it's going to happen. You need to know that. Young people, it's going to happen. Now, I remember when I was a teenager and I began to feel God was impressing upon me that he wanted me to go to Bible school. And I remember... Some of my friends began to ridicule me and say, you just got accepted at two major universities in Canada. And so, young people, not everyone who hangs out with you is your friend. (laughs) Remember that. 
Not everyone who wants to hang out with you is necessarily your friend. I only had one person who didn't ridicule me for my choice to go to Bible school, uh, and it hurt. I realized I had to start distancing myself from people who I realized weren't my friends. You know, some of the most challenging things are for people who are, who are married to an unbelieving spouse, and they go to church, and they're ridiculed for their faith. That's not easy. And they're in every church, ridiculed. I remember when I was in high school, I had one English teacher found out that uh, English literature, he found out I was a preacher's kid, and he'd often throw little jokes and ridicule him, and he says, oh yeah, the book of Acts, Acts 1 to 8, oh yeah, those were the first communists, you know, they sold everything and put it all in the pot, so everyone divided everything, yeah, yeah, they, 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 they had it before Stalin, little jabs, anyone ever been jabbed at like that? Am I the only one? <laughs> yeah. And of course, as a student in high school, I have no authority over the teacher to tell him off, even though some young people in high schools do today. I have no authority to do that. You don't go beyond your authority. So you just take it and you say, Lord, you remember. You remember. Well, if you want your Christianity to bring a reward to you in heaven, you need to do something for God, for the kingdom. You may not build the wall, though some of you may have been a part of building this church and building some walls and that, but you can get involved in a ministry of a church, but if you do, you're going to get some opposition. It's going to come to you. And I want to encourage you, it doesn't mean you're necessarily doing something wrong, you might be doing something right. So let me give you just five things as we look at how Nia dealt with the opposition, how he tried to encourage the people in the work of the kingdom, all right? So the first thing, let's go to number one. The first thing you need to remember when opposition comes crashing into your life as a follower of Jesus Christ, you got to consider the cause of the opposition. Why are people ridiculing and slamming you and, and making up schemes and, and all this other stuff, trying to intimidate you or manipulate Why are they doing it? Is it because you're doing something for God? Well, that's good. Go to the next scripture, please. This is what happened to these enemies of the work of God, Sambalat. And so when Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he was furious, indignant, and he mocked the Jews. Let me tell you something. Everybody has a Sambalat in their life. Anyone know who their Sambalat is? <laughs> if you don't have one, you're going to get one. Because Sambalas are the ones that are not Christians. They don't understand why you would spend time and energy and your talents to go to church, to help a church. And what non-Christians can't reason, they ridicule. And you can't get too mad at them because they're in the kingdom of darkness. How are you going to expect people in the kingdom of darkness to understand things in the kingdom of light? And so what some people can't reason why you do what you do for God, for his church, for the kingdom, they ridicule. They'll do that. And they've done it to me and they'll do it to you. Well, let me give you some of the weapons of Satan that you'll be opposed with if you try to do something for God. All right? These are all the weapons uh, that are mentioned in Nehemiah chapter 4 that not only Nehemiah went through, but everyone who helped build on the wall, they went through this. Number one was ridicule. Second one was a conspiracy. As you read through Nehemiah, they accused Nehemiah of setting himself up as a king. It's a lie. Conspiracy. Number three, confusion. We're going to come, we're going to hit you here, we're going to hit you there. And that's how the devil always works. He tries to come into a church, tries to come into a, a work of God and bring confusion. Number four, lies. Lies. Satan is the father of what? It's the father of lies. All right? And you will be lied about. Satan will make sure you're lied about. Jesus was lied about. You and I will be lied about. Uh, e is gossip. People will gossip about you. And then F is fear. These are the weapons that always try to come in and destroy the church. 
You know, probably the one that is the most guilty in every church, not just our church, every church, and let me just warn you, is gossip. You know, when you hear something and you can't validate it, you are either a open door, or I'm sorry, you're either a gate or a door. You're either a gate where you let that gossip go into your mouth, into your heart, and back out of your mouth to someone else. That's called being a gate of gossip. Or you slam the door shut and say, can I quote you on that, Dan? Can I quote you and go tell Pastor Roger? No, 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 don't, don't quote me. That's, that's what someone told me. Did you verify that? No, I'm just, you know, I just heard it. Gossip is so painful. It really is. I was talking to someone a little while back, and uh, someone in their family died, and there was a lot of confusion over the death. And someone began to spread a rumor and gossip. And no one knows who started it, but by the time it got to the person who lost the loved one, they were told that your loved one died because they cheated on their spouse, and that's why they died. See how gossip goes? And you say, well, I, I didn't hear that one. Well, if you gossip, you're, you're going to be judged for all the gossip that goes on. How would you like to be the loved one to hear something like that? So it's a lie. It's gossip. It brought confusion. And can you imagine the pain? Can you imagine the fear? Well, if that's true, maybe they're not in heaven. Don't be a gossip. You're aligning yourself to the wrong kingdom. All right? Listen to me. When someone says, hey, did you hear so-and-so about pastor? Say, no, I didn't. But can I quote you on that? Can I quote you on that, Jay? Sure, go right ahead. Good, I think I'm gonna. That's how you stop the work of the devil. Be a door. Don't be a gate. Amen? This is what Nehemiah went through. This is what the church goes through. And it's important that we stop and we recognize the arsenal of Satan and we don't use those tools. Amen? Consider the cause of why you're being ridiculed, why you're being opposed. Number two, consider the character of the person who is opposing you, who's giving you trouble at work, trouble at home, trouble in the church, trouble in the neighborhood, around the Thanksgiving table. Everyone's got someone in the family that's going to have some trouble around the Thanksgiving table. There's at least one. What about Bob? Anyone ever see that movie? What about Bob? Everyone's got Bob in their house. <laughs> Consider the character. When you get ridiculed, you have some enemies, and they begin to oppose you. Remember, are they opposing you because they don't know Jesus Christ? They don't know any better? They're in the kingdom of darkness? How many know you can't judge someone who's not a Christian the same as we look at fruit of a Christian? And you're going to be opposed. It hurts more when it comes from people who you thought were Christians than it does people who are not, but it's going to hurt. Put up the next scripture. The apostles of Jesus Christ... They were doing exactly what Jesus said. They were preaching the gospel. They were talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they were called into this big religious council. And they were just told off and said, you can't preach that name. And you got to stop putting his sin on us. And, and they beat him and they said, get out of here. And it says, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were found worthy to suffer what? Shame. Why? For his name's sake. See, when you get ridiculed for his name's sake, that's a good thing. It can still hurt, but how many of you know that's a good thing? You're just like Christ. And he was ridiculed. He was put down. People say, well, pastor, I don't know what you're talking about. No one's ever ridiculed. No one's ever mocked me. No one's ever opposed me for my Christianity. Well, let me tell you something. Don't tell too many about that. Maybe you're a closet Christian. Because if you're a real Christian, you will be ridiculed. You will be opposed. And it will come from your family. It will come from a spouse, from children, from aunts and uncles, cousins. 
you're going to get it. But rejoice that you are found worthy to suffer shame, even from the ones in your own family. Rejoice and say, well, Lord, I thank you that I am. There's no way around it. If you're living out your testimony of Jesus Christ, you are going to be opposed. Someone's going to laugh at you. Someone's going to ridicule you, all right? Remember that. Opposition sometimes is a, a hidden badge that you're doing something right with your testimony of Jesus Christ. And if you're never being opposed, you need to ask Jesus, why am I not being opposed? We don't look for it. We don't look for it, but it does come with the lifestyle, amen? Mark it down. When you go for God, when you go to do something for God, when you're going to do a work for God, it's going to bite you. Satan is not going to let you do something for the kingdom of God without pushing back. But I have good news. As God told the Apostle Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. His grace will be sufficient for you to keep doing what God's called you to do. Amen? Amen. Number three. Consider the cause. Consider the character of the people that are opposing and ridiculing you. And number three. Consider the company that you keep. I mean, it's important that you keep some good company, some good Christians. You know, if you're blessed and you have more than one Christian in your family, you ought to encourage one another. I'm proud of you all for being here today at church. Hebrew says, let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Let us not stop going to church as some are in the manner of doing, but let us encourage one another as we see the day of Christ approaching. Good for you. Some people have not yet come back to church. I can't wait till you come back to church, all right? Because in church, this is where we encourage one another. It concerns me because becoming a churchgoer is a habit, and stop going to church can become a bad habit. You need to have company of those who can encourage you, lift you up. Nehemiah realized this. He didn't hang out with the Tobias. He didn't hang out with the sand ballots, he hung out with the people that were doing the work, all right? Different people, like the ushers hang out with ushers and people involved in the food pantry ministry, they hang out, they encourage, they joke, they laugh. It's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to lift each other up. Even Jesus realized this. And he was ridiculed for a lot of things that he did. Not even, he wasn't just ridiculed by the religious scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees. He was ridiculed by everyday people that just didn't understand what he was doing. There's a story of him going to pray for a, a pastor, a ruler of a synagogue, we'd call them pastors, a ruler of a synagogue, his name was Jairus, and his daughter was dying. And you have to understand the theology of Christ and the theology of Christianity. We really don't believe in death, though we talk about it. Death means eternal separation from God. So Jesus, when someone died, he would never say they're dead. He would say they're asleep. You with me? When we die, our bodies fall asleep, and in the resurrection, we get new bodies. All right? So the body really never dies. It just transitions into a resurrected uh, new body. And we are known, we will be known even as we are known. So when you see my new body, you'll recognize me. All right? This body is for earth. My new body will be for space, earth, heavens. All right? So Jesus would say, he's not dead, he's asleep. So let's go to the next scripture. You need to understand why they ridiculed Jesus for his theology. And Jesus said, he went to Jairus, and they said, hey, your, your daughter died. And so Jesus said, the child is not dead, but is what? He says, the child's not in hell. He's not separated from God. And what did they do when he said that? You ever been ridiculed for your theology? And what did Jesus do with all those people that ridiculed them? He put them all out. You want to know why we don't see miracles today? because we let the ridiculers in the same room where we want the, the miracle and it don't work that way. You got to get those ridiculers and those unbelievers out. And what did he do? He put them all outside and he took the child, the child that was sleeping, we'd call him dead, the little girl, the child that was sleeping by the hand and said, Talitha Kumai, 
which it means or which is translated means, little girl, I say to you, and she rose from the dead. But was there a miracle without the ridicule? No. You want to see the work of God go forth? You want to see signs and wonders? You, you got to understand, ridicule will come. Now, put yourself in those Jews' shoes and pretend you were ridiculing Jesus because he said, the child is not dead, the child is just sleeping. Pretend that was you. Pretend Jesus threw you out of the house and get out. Threw you out of the house and then the little girl come walking out the front door while you're outside laughing. Put yourself in the... What would you do? Would you harden your heart because Jesus put egg on your face for your unbelief? Or would you humble yourself and say, oh my gosh, what an idiot I was. What an idiot I was. I ridiculed someone who did a miracle. Consider the company. Consider the company. See, this is what... um, Nehemiah had to deal with. Nehemiah was trying to get them to build the wall and and Jerusalem is huge. And he's building the wall over here and he's motivating people and he's encouraging people and Sinbalat and Tobiah are just spreading lies and gossip and schemes and and all this stuff. And and, uh, go to the next scripture, please. And it says, he got so mad You know, when people keep spreading lies and gossip and stuff like that, it can hinder the work of God. It can. And so that's why I said, my God, remember Tobiah and Sambalat. These are enemies because of their what? He didn't have an axe to grind with them. He had an axe to grind them because they tried to hurt the work of God. When someone opposes you, please listen to me. It's not because you're better looking than them. You're smarter than them. You have a better position than them. When someone is opposing you and you're a Christian, it's because of Christ in you, the hope of glory, and they hate it. They hate it. And look what else. They had a prophetess named Noadiah, a so-called prophetess, that was manipulating her prophecies and the rest of the so-called prophets who have made me afraid. This is what he said. They had so-called... Not everyone who claims to be a prophet is a prophet, you know. Not everyone who claims to be a prophetess is a prophetess. How do you know someone's truly a prophet or a prophetess? Thank you. You shall know them not by their prophecies, The prophecies that I give are to be judged. The prophecies that Pina gives are to be judged. The prophecies that Herman or uh, anyone else, Nancy, may be judged. But it's not how anointed you are. It's how straight you walk. The fruit. It's got to be the fruit. In the church, we sometimes idolize certain gifts and if people has a gift we go oh wow they prophesy they're a prophet they're a prophetess you look at the fruit and we're allowed to judge each other by the fruit we're allowed to do that amen but not only did nehemiah have problems with people who were the so-called prophets and prophetesses go to the next scripture he had people from his own nationality For many in Judah, the Jews, were pledged to him, Tobiah, one of the enemies, because he was a son-in-law to Shechaniah. Do you know what he's saying? You ready? Don't put your family above the work of God. Oh, he's from such and such a family. Don't go near them. That's called idolatry. When you put a family, a person, above the work of God. And some of these Jews were so committed because of a family, they opposed the work of God. Look at it. Let's read it. For many in Judah, the Jews, were pledged to him, Tobiah, 
who was against the work of God because he was what? Family! Can't go against family! Nehemiah did. Nehemiah did. That's heavy, isn't it? Now, if you have an unsafe spouse, an unsafe children, you know what that's all about. Very heavy. Dangerous. But they scorned. They laughed at Jesus on the cross too. But let me just encourage you. All right? If the devil is scorning you and laughing at you and ridiculing you, don't let him laugh you out of the church. Don't let him laugh you out of your family. Don't let him laugh you out of the work that you're doing for Jesus Christ because that's the whole purpose for ridicule. That's why he is opposing you. He wants to wear you down. He wants to get you to stop. He doesn't want you to have fruit. He doesn't want you to have a reward in heaven. He wants you to say, it's just too much. It's just too much. It's just too much. Don't let him do that, amen? Number one, consider the cause of why someone is opposing you. Are they opposing you because you're being a jerk? <laughs> or are they opposing you because you're being Christ-like? All right. Number two, consider the character. All right. Maybe they don't know any better. They're in the kingdom of darkness. They don't understand you because they can't reason why you do what you do. You know what? That's why they ridicule you. Number three, remember the company. Listen, we all need encouragement. We all need to be lifted up and exhorted, and we all need to, you know, keep the good walk of faith. Make sure you got some good friends around you. That's why the church is so necessary today. And then number four, consider the compensation one day that you will get from Jesus Christ because you did a work for him down in this world. You gave your treasures, you gave of your time, you gave of your talent, you gave of your testimony. I mean, you sacrificed sometimes out of your family and other things just to do something because you saw the greater good. Amen? You saw the greater good. Jesus said this one time. Um, go to the scripture, please. He said, when men persecute you, they ridicule you, oppose you, and they revile you, and they will, they will, and say all matter of what? Evil against you for my name's sake. All right, you got to remember, it's not because you're stubborn and you just can't ever be wrong and you can't ever admit to a mistake. It's not what he's talking about. You're doing it for his name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Read the rest with me, please. For great is your reward and heaven. Amen. There's coming a compensation, and those are eternal. All right? They're not like a paycheck that disappears. In a, it's eternal. It's eternal. When we get to heaven, all right, I'm praying and I'm believing that we may be the generation that actually sees the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that be nice? I often say, let's do a rapture practice. <laughs> We're all going to go up. Rapture practice. But if we don't, and some of us fall asleep, when we get our resurrected bodies, the first thing that will happen up in heaven, all right, marriage, supper of the Lamb, and then the judgment seat of Christ that you do not need to fear. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you are letting your light shine, you are glorifying God by doing good works down here, you will be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. It's called the Bema Seat. We all will appear before the Bema Seat. And all that we've done will be put through the fire. And everything you did will be tested to see if you did it for yourself, to be seen by men, to be a big fish in a little church, because you want everyone to know how important you are. And everything you did with that motivation, the Bible says, your reward will be like wood, hay, and rubble, and it will burn up in front of everybody. You with me? But those of us who do things not to be seen, not for self-glory, not to be seen. You see how spiritual he is? What a man. What a woman of God. We do things with a right heart for the glory of God. Our works will be purified through the fire 
and it will come forth as gold, silver, and precious stones. You see, when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, we're all going to be warded differently based on the motivation of why we did what we did. Did we really do it for him? Or did we do it because we wanted to be seen by men? Remember Jesus said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing? Remember he said, some first will be last, but not all. And some last will be first, but not all. All right. We're going to be rewarded. We're going to be rewarded. And I look forward to that, that compensation. Number five, and I finish with this. Consider the conclusion of your short life. Consider the conclusion of the whole matter. You know, there's a saying in America. I know we've got a lot of people from different countries here. But there's a saying here, and maybe you can finish it. He who laughs last, laughs best. Now there's another one that says, he who laughs last didn't get the joke. And that's true, all right? But he who laughs last, laughs best. And in the work of God, you're going to be opposed. And the devil is going to use people. People that you know, people that you don't know, people that are in the family, the people that are not in your family, people at work, people in church, people in your neighborhood. They're gonna, the devil's going to use people to oppose you and hurt you. But remember, he who laughs last, laughs best. I'm not talking about your laugh. I'm talking about God's laugh. All right? And God's laugh is not the laugh of an evil God ready to just wipe out everything. No, no, that's not what it is. God's laugh is a laugh of, I gave you my son, I gave you my word, I gave you the principles to live by, everything you need is right here, all right? But if you reject the wisdom of God's word, you will reap what you sow. And that's not a laugh of an evil God, that's a laugh of a warning God. You know, when people laugh at you at work and laugh at you in church and laugh at you in in your neighborhood, how many know you can go home and laugh yourself to sleep because you know the conclusion of the matter? The conclusion of the matter. Unless they repent and see as you see, they're not going to have the last laugh. I mean, put the scripture up here of wisdom. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ is our righteousness and wisdom and counsel and Solomon wrote this, and he said, Since you rejected me, speaking of wisdom, the wisdom of God, when I called, I called to you, I warned you, since you ignored all my uh, advice and would not accept my rebuke, I in turn will laugh at your disaster. I will mock when calamity overtakes you. I will mock. when. Is that the mocking of a mean God? No, that's a God that said this, Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Don't deceive yourself. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. He that sows to the flesh, sows lies, sows slander, sows schemes, sows fear, uses their gifts to manipulate and get their way, shall reap of the flesh corruption. But he that sows to the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, so of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Amen? Make sure you're sowing to the Spirit. Make sure you're sowing things that build up one another. Make sure you're sowing to good things. You're sowing to good things. You know, Roger recently talked about, uh, we had a board meeting this uh, Wednesday, and we talked about, uh, uh, one one of the deacons said, you know what, what can we do to really, you know, protect the church and people? And so we came up with, you know, putting the signs up. And I want to tell you something. That was a united decision of the board. Do you know, as goes the board of a church, so goes the board. You know, when a church is united, it's because a board is united. You need to know that. 
Because sometimes the devil gets around and he tries to spread a little slander, a little lie in the church. You know how he spreads a little lie and a slander in the church? Someone says, the church is divided, pray for unity. The church is divided, pray. I've heard that in this church. Stop saying that. The church is not divided. The church is not divided. The church is united. You need to, if you hear someone say that, tell them, no, 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 that's the wrong prayer request. The church is united. You need to know that. Don't let that be a gate in your life, but slam the door shut. All right? Our church is united. Our board is united. And I'm so glad for it. But con- consider the conclusion of the matter, all right? When you are united, that's when God can come down and we can do a work for God. And we want to be united so we can do a work for God. Amen? Only the kingdom of God will last. I conclude with this. A true story of the Roman Empire when it once existed. There are two little boys that were playmates. They used to play together. One was Julian and the other one was Agathon. Agathon and Julian were playmates. And when they grew up, they went separate ways. Julian became the Roman emperor, and Agathon became a huge church leader and became a prophet in Christianity in the Roman Empire. Julian pretended to be a Christian, and when he succeeded to the throne, he decided to turn his back on Jesus Christ, and he became known as Julian the Apostate. You can Google it, okay? Julian the Apostate. So he began to mock Christians and he opposed them and he persecuted them. And he found out that his playmate friend, Agathon, was a great leader in the church. So he called him into the palace one time and he said, Hey, Agathon, how's the carpenter from Nazareth doing? Is he getting much work? I've been giving him a lot of dead people so he can build coffins for all those dead Christians. How's the work of that carpenter doing? And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Agathon, and Agathon began to prophesy, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Jesus from Nazareth is building coffins, and he's building one for you, and soon you will be in it. Two years later, Julian was killed by Persians, and his kingdom crumbled. And the work of the carpenter from Nazareth is still going forth, and the work of Julian the Empire no longer exists. You with me? No matter how much people mock us, lie about us, spread slander, scheme, try to put fear in you, put false prophecies over you, you know what? The kingdom of Jesus Christ is going to go on and on, and you got to consider the conclusion. Amen. Sometimes you hear me say, Read the end of the book. We win. (laughs) There's a lot of battles in the middle, but if you read Revelation 22, 21, 22, 20, 20, we win, amen? Amen. So how many of you have been ridiculed lately for something? Raise your hand. Put it up nice and high. Put it up. Don't be ashamed. All right? No servant is above their master. No servant is above that. If they did it for Christ, they'll do it to us. But you're in good company. You're, po- you're being opposed because you're doing something for Christ and keep doing it. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Amen. Bow your heads. Father, we have looked at your word today of viewing opposition from a heavenly perspective. And it doesn't mean necessarily we're doing something wrong, although it can. But Lord, as Nehemiah's case, it was because he was doing something good for you, a work for the kingdom. And I pray, Lord God, that this message would encourage those, Lord, that are being mocked, slandered, lied about. People are scheming. People are intimidating them. Uh, Lord, help us, Lord, to realize, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. 
encourage us, Lord. Bless your people today. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name that you have kept anyone from dying in this church from the coronavirus. Continue to protect us, Lord. Don't let it spread. And Lord, use us to pray for people. In Jesus' name, I pray for my Aunt Ruth Ann. I speak life to her. She has coronavirus, Lord. I speak life to her in Jesus' name. Father, Romans 8, 2, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. And Lord, I speak that over my Aunt Ruth Ann, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, for bringing Tony and Maria Capuano from it, Lord God, and others, Lord God. Protect us, and Lord, help us to celebrate, Lord, with grateful hearts this Thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. 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 Remember,